We've been taking a brisk jog or run through the Old Testament. We started in Genesis and have made our way to the fourth book of the Bible, the book of Numbers. So find that place, if you will, and we'll, we'll kind of walk through the book of Numbers. The book of Numbers is the fourth book of the Pentateuch, which is fancy Greek talk for five books. Um, it's sometimes called the Torah or the books of Moses or the books of the law. And uh, Numbers is a unique book. It's a traveling book. I told you yeah, last time that Leviticus was a stationary book. They stay in one place. But in Numbers, uh, it's really divided into three sections. Uh, you've, got them travel, you've got them at Mount Sinai, traveling to the verge of the promised land, wandering around the wilderness for 40 years, and then a new generation on the edge of the promised land. So I said three, but that, 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 I think that was four, wasn't it? So uh, it, geographically, it's kind of organized. There are lots of laws and things given in, in between, but some powerful stories that have a huge impact on the New Testament and on our faith as Christians. Um, Numbers opens with what you would expect in a book called Numbers, uh, a census and a genealogy. And uh, today, genealogies have become popular. People are um, learning more and more about their family trees and where they came from and that kind of thing. And that was important to the people of God back in the day. And you'll notice that Numbers has two censuses. It has a census of the generation that left Egypt and a census of the generation that's about to enter the promised land. Uh, 40 years later. Um, in the class that I teach, uh, sometimes I would get Brian Hart to draw the Old Testament on the whiteboard. And when he got to Numbers um, and Deuteronomy, he would draw a Pepsi can. And of course, that was lost on the students. But do y'all remember that Pepsi at one time had a slogan, the choice of a new generation? Well, the book of Numbers is about the choices the old generation made and the choices the new generation would make. It's really the story of two generations and whether they will choose to obey and trust and love God or not. Uh, one of the big themes in Numbers is a phrase that's repeated over 80 times, and that is, the Lord said to Moses. So we'll learn a good bit about Moses and a good bit about his relationship with the Lord as we look at the, at the book of Numbers. Uh, when they start with a census, if you look at chapter 2, you'll see that the tales are given even as to how the tribes are to be arranged in the camp. And you remember that Israel is a tribal nation. It's made up of 12 tribes. Jacob had 12 sons. And so these 12 tribes are arranged. And if you look at the arrangement, you'll discover it's in the shape of a cross. And at the center of that cross is the tabernacle, the dwelling place of God. And God was visibly with his people. At night, he appeared as a fire. In the day, it was a huge cloud. Um, and so God dwelt with his people, and they had a tangible, visible reminder of God's presence with them at all times. I wonder how our lives would be different if we constantly remembered that God was with us. Uh, I'm afraid we tend to forget and go off on our own. We are prone to wander. Um, but if we could remember that God is with us, uh, so we see the order of the, the arrangement of the camps. As you flip over, you'll see in chapter 5 instructions about purity. Uh, when we looked at Exodus, you remember there was concern about God going with his people because uh, he wasn't sure the people were going to make it. So there are instructions about purity and, and creating a welcoming environment in which God can move and work. Uh, sin separates us from God. Sin has horrible effects on our lives. Purity creates an environment in which God moves and works. And so the instructions are to, to keep the, the camp pure, and you'll see some of those there. When you get to chapter 6, you'll have the background that we need to understand other stories. Uh, there is the uh, commitment and covenant of the Nazarite. Um, I, Maybe I can ask you a trivia question. Do y'all know any Nazarites that appear later in Scripture? Samson, yes, thank you. Samson uh, was a Nazarite. You remember he had that long hair. He wasn't supposed to go around dead, bought dead, dead stuff. And um, uh, not supposed to drink alcohol or anything made from grapes. You get to the New Testament and we find John the Baptist in this Nazaritic uh, form. And even as you read the New Testament, the book of Acts, Paul will take vows that relate to, and these are short-term vows, not the lifelong things like Samson 
and John the Baptist had, but it will be vows connected to the shaving of head and hair and that kind of thing that's laid out for you here in Numbers chapter 6. So uh, this Nazarite uh, covenant uh, becomes an important part later. It's also a point of confusion. Where was Jesus from? Nazareth. And often he is identified as Jesus of Nazareth. Nazareth sounds like Nazarite, but it's two different words. So Jesus is not a Nazarite. Uh, if he were a Nazarite, he would not have uh, turned the water into wine. He would not have instituted the, the, the Last Supper, uh, the Passover meal. Uh, and so, so this is a, a separate tradition that we see in the life of Samson and in the life of John the Baptist. But that gets confusing. In chapter 6, God gives a blessing to Moses that is still used today. We've set it to music. It's powerful. He says, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. And so this was the blessing that the priests were to use, and we still use it today. In fact, I, I include it in most every wedding ceremony that, that I uh, have a chance to be part of. When you get to chapter 9, you see the first anniversary of the Passover. Uh, why did they celebrate Passover every year? I mean, it, it happened, but why, why have a year anniversary and a second year anniversary and a third year anniversary and a fourth year anniversary? Why every year? To remember. To remember, to remind. We forget things. Uh, we forget God's goodness. We forget God's grace. We forget all the things he has already delivered us from. And so the Passover meal was a time to remember, to celebrate, to give thanks, and to pass these things on to the next generation. In the class I teach over there, we've been talking about the role of family. And, you know, God set up families where when you leave the house, you talk about God. When you come in from the house, you talk about God. When you sit down to eat, you talk about God. When you wake up in the morning, you talk about God. When you lie down at night, you talk about God. And if people would have followed those instructions, there would never be a generation that didn't know of God's love and presence and power in their lives. Uh, that's the design for families, that this instruction and love for the Lord be instilled in children. And so Passover provides an opportunity to pass these things on to help others to know. And chapter 9 has some beautiful stories about God's presence. Uh, the end of chapter 9 talks about the cloud that was there uh, by day and the fire by night. And you'll notice as you read chapter 9 a little bit that this was how they knew when to go. Um, they stayed in one place as long as the cloud rested on the tabernacle. But when God's presence began to move, they would pack up <laughs> quickly and follow. Uh, and so God led them. And as you look at the account here, sometimes they'd be in one place for two days or three days. Sometimes they'd just spend the night there and they'd move on the next day. It might be ten days that they might camp in a particular place. But they look to God to lead them on a daily basis in terms of even where they would lay their head down at night and where they would have camp together. And, and there's a powerful image there for us uh, that we would look for God's leadership and God's direction um, when we go out and when we come in uh, at every part of our lives there. Well, turn the page in chapter 11 and you will discover that these uh, children of Israel that were complaining all the way through Exodus uh, are still complaining when we get to Numbers. They grumble, they murmur, they complain. Now, on the list of things that are bad, uh, let's say, well, murder's kind of bad, isn't it? We should cut down on killing people. Stealing's bad. Lying's bad. Where does complaining fall on that list? It's bad too. It's bad too. It is. <laughs> complaining can do an awful lot of harm. I'll let you in on a secret during the pandemic. Complaining is more contagious than the virus. Would y'all agree? If you're around people that are complaining, it, 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 it multiplies. And the people complain. Now what's wrong with them complaining? They were living in harsh circumstances there in the wilderness. Why is it wrong for them to complain? 
What do their complaints say? God's not doing what he said he would. Yes, they are complaining about God. Um, that God's provision is not enough for them. And as you read through, you'll discover that God provides everything for them. Water and food and bread and, and even their shoes don't wear out. Uh, God is at work in a wonderful, powerful way. Uh, but the people have not discovered their satisfaction in God. And I'd love to point my finger at them and fuss at them until I realize that, um, you know, we look to be fulfilled and satisfied in all kinds of places too, just like they did. And we grumble and we complain. So the people are complaining, but there were consequences to their complaints. And um, one of those consequences is that they really frustrated Moses. Let's tune in here in chapter 11. I'm going to start at verse 11. He asked the Lord, Why have you brought this trouble on your servant? What have I done to displease you that you put the burden of all these people on me? Did I conceive all these people? Did I give them birth? Why do you tell me to carry them in my arms as a nurse carries an infant to the land you promised on oath to their ancestors? Where can I get meat for all these people? They keep wailing to me. Give us meat to eat. I cannot carry all these people by myself. The burden is too heavy for me. If this is how you're going to treat me, please go ahead and kill me. If I have found favor in your eyes, do not let me face my own ruin. Now, who's doing the talking? Moses, man of God. Who's he talking to? God. He says something. Mm. Yes, well, Moses probably should have been, but God was patient with Moses, right? And God provides for Moses, and he will give him the help that he needs. Um, but here we see Moses' heart of frustration. Um, the people have made things so difficult for Moses. Moses is trying to lead them in the way they should go, and the people's complaints and bickering and rebellious nature just make it unbearable for Moses. Um, and his help, his relief, is going to be from the Lord. Well, if you keep reading in this chapter, you'll discover that God provides for Moses and he says, I'm going to provide meat for all these complaining people. Um, and, and Moses has a, a moment of weakness. Look at verse 23. Well, might be even before that. Verse 21. Moses said, here I am among 600,000 men on foot. And you say, I will give them meat to eat for a whole month. Would they have enough if flocks and herds were slaughtered for them? Would there be enough if all the fish of the sea were caught for them? And the Lord answered Moses, Is the Lord's arm too short? Now you will see whether or not what I say will come true for you. Uh, God had promised that they would have meat. And Moses begins to say, Well, Lord, I don't, I don't think you can do it. <laughs> I don't think there's enough fish. I don't think there's enough flocks. And, and God says, My arm's not short. <laughs> if I tell you I'm going to do something, I'm going to do something. Now, I'd like to fuss at Moses at this point, but then I'd have to fuss at me too. Uh, because we often lose our faith in the incredible power of God. God is able to do much more than we ask or even imagine. And like Moses, sometimes we have moments of weakness where we, we don't realize uh, that God is able to do so much more. Uh, God's arm is not short. God is able to provide for his people. He's able to provide for you and for me. And he wants us to trust him. As you turn the page, you'll see that these, this rebellious spirit continues among the people. And in chapter 12, it's led by Moses' brother and sister. Now, family is a gift from God. But it can also be a lot of trouble, too. I, I, I won't look for too many amens. But, uh, but families have problems here. Miriam was that wonderful girl that looked after Moses in the bulrushes and um, called, you know, Pharaoh's daughter called her over. And, you know, she's been used by God in a great way. She's a prophetess. She leads the people in worship. Good things are happening. But she gets jealous of her brother. And she doesn't like some of her brother's choices. And I'm afraid... There's a racial component to this. 
Look at chapter 12, verse 1. Miriam and Aaron began to talk against Moses because of his Cushite wife, for he had married a Cushite. Now, where is Cush? All right, yours says Ethiopia. Okay, where's Ethiopia? Africa. Africa, right? He has a Cushite wife. Does his sister like it? No. And on account of that, she leads a rebellion against Moses. And God intervenes. And look at how God defends Moses. Um, this is chapter 12, verse 6. Listen to my words. When there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, reveal myself to them in visions. I speak to them in dreams. But this is not true of my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. With him I speak face to face, clearly and not in riddles. He sees the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And if you keep reading in the story, you'll discover that Miriam, Moses' sister, gets leprosy. Now, what does leprosy look like? White. Your skin turns white. So she didn't like Moses' Cushite, black wife, and God turns her pale white as a result. Now don't tell me God doesn't have a sense of humor or a sense of irony there. So Moses has to intercede for his sister. And after seven days of uh, being exiled from the camp, uh, Miriam's leprosy clears up and uh, she's cured and able to return that way. Well, they get to the edge of the promised land, and it's time now to put their faith and trust in God and to, to rely on God's promises, and 12 spies are sent into the promised land to explore the land, and they explore the land for 40 days. That's a good, solid biblical number. There's one from each of the 12 tribes, so it's representation of all these people that are camped together in that form of a cross with the tabernacle in the middle. And um, 12 men go, and 12 men come back, and um, they come back and give this report. Uh, this is chapter 13. I'm starting to read about verse 27. We went into the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. Uh, they brought back these huge grapes and that kind of thing. And that's a symbol for Israel even today in modern times. They use the symbol of the spies carrying uh, the grapes on the pole uh, from, from their visit there. Verse 28, but the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified, walled, and very large. We even saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amakites live in the Negev, and the Hittites, and the Jezebites, and the Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, we should go up and take possession of the land, for we can surely do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We can't attack those people. They are stronger than us. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there. The descendants of Anak come from the Nephilim. We, sin, we seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. So as you keep reading, you'll discover that 12 spies are sent. Ten of the 12 say, let's don't go. In fact, they decide they're going to stone Moses to death, get a new leader, and get the new leader to take them back to Egypt. They're standing on the verge of this promised land that God has told them he will give them, the land of their fathers. But they are not willing to trust God. They are not willing to do what God has asked them to do. Now, when they got to the Red Sea, what did God do? Did God let them die there? No, nope, part of the Red Sea. Uh, when they faced their enemies, you remember there's that story where Moses holds the staff up, and as long as Moses' staff was held, they had victory over their enemies. God has been taking care of them every step of the way. But here at this moment, they turn against God. They turn against Moses. And the ten 
who represent the majority lead the people astray. Only two men stood for God. Y'all remember which two? Caleb and Joshua. And their story um, is expounded on as we keep going in the other books. So God becomes very angry with the people. And he does something that is very cruel. Y'all know what he does? I'll tell you because it's a pattern. He gives them what they asked for. It's pretty awful. He gives them what they asked for. They said, we don't want to go into the promised land. And God said, okay. You don't have to go. You will wander around in the wilderness for 40 years. Your children will get to enter the promised land. But no one over the age of 20. Except... Joshua and Caleb. God gives them what they wanted with horrible results. And I can't help but think about the way it is with us. If you live your life not wanting God to have any part of your life, if you exclude God from your life, you know where that leads you? It leads you to a place we call hell where God is excluded from every part of our life. Uh, hell, by definition, is a place without God, a separation from God. Uh, and so there are times when God gives us exactly what we ask for, but, but, it, but it's horrible what we ask for. The people here refuse to trust God. They refuse to go into the promised land, and they spend the next 40 years wandering around in the wilderness. Now, God continues to take care of them. Uh, God continues to help them. Uh, God continues to fight their battles for them. But uh, they pay the penalty for their sin. As you keep turning the pages in Numbers, you'll see that they keep rebelling. Uh, the Levites begin to rebel. And by the time you get to chapter 17, there's this incredible contest where the people are rebelling against Moses and Aaron. And God says, okay, everybody bring out their staffs. <laughs> And Moses' staff blooms and buds. And God says, okay, let's keep his staff and let's put it in the Ark of the Covenant so that y'all can remember the results of rebellion. <laughs> you can remember my affirmation of Aaron and of Moses. Um, so chapter 17 contains that incredible story. We get to chapter 20 and we see a place where even Moses fails. Uh, God, the people are complaining again, and they don't have water. And God tells Moses in chapter 20, about verse 8, Take the staff, and you and your brother Aaron, gather the assembly together. Speak to that rock before their eyes, and it will pour out its water. And you will bring water out of the rock for the community, so that they and their livestock can drink. Now, this was not the first time that this has happened. God's been providing water for them from the rock all the way along. We get to the New Testament, and it'll tell us that that rock is Christ. But when you turn the page, or in my Bible, when you turn the page, uh, verse 12 of chapter 20, um, well, actually it's before that, about verse 10, Moses says, Listen, you rebels, must we bring you water out of the rock? And then Moses rose, raised his arm and struck the rock twice with his staff. Water gushed out, and the community of the livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not trust me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, I will not bring this community into the land I give them. Wow. Intense judgment there. Moses, even though he was God's instrument, oversteps. And he puts himself in the place of God and does not trust God and does not honor God. And Moses will intercede for the people, but you remember that Moses is not allowed to enter the promised land after leading God's children through the wilderness 40 years. Uh, he looks at it from a distance. God shows him in a miraculous way, the land, but he is not able to enter the land. And, and the roots of that go back to this story here in Numbers 20. We get to the last part of Numbers 20, and we see that Aaron dies. 
And we find a phrase here that was found all the way in Genesis, but it's just interesting. Um, how do we talk about death? We don't always say someone died because that just sounds a little harsh, a little cruel. So we, we'll talk about someone passing away or going home or... Yeah, we'll use lots of different ways of talking about it so that we don't have to use that harsh death talk. Here in the Bible, and, and it's, as I said, it's in, it's in Genesis too, but here we find it in the other books, Aaron will be gathered to his people. And that gives us an insight into God's plan there, a foreshadowing of what he's prepared. Uh, because death does not end our existence. Aaron is gathered to his people, not just his body. But Aaron himself will be gathered to his people. And so even here in the Old Testament, uh, early on, we get some views uh, of that. Well, turn to chapter 21, the next chapter, and you see an incredible story. The people are grumbling, they're complaining again, and this time, snakes come, and they begin to bite the people. What happens if you get bit by one of these snakes? You die. So the people cry out to Moses. Moses intercedes for the people before God. And God instructs Moses, and these instructions sound strange. God instructs Moses to take a bronze snake and put it on a pole and set it in the center of the camp. And he tells Moses, everyone who looks at this bronze snake will live. And that's what happens. Now, I can just hear people carrying on, you know, I want medicine, I want herbs, I want this. I don't want to go look at some bronze snake. We're stubborn by nature. But if you would look, you would live. Um, it wasn't human effort. It was the grace of God. It was looking in faith that caused people to be saved. We get to the New Testament. Jesus is trying to explain who he is to Nicodemus, this one learned in the Old Testament. And he says, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. And so Jesus is the serpent in the wilderness. He is the one who saves us. Now, why do you think God told him to put a snake on the pole? I mean, the thing that bit him, the thing that caused him injury. What? I've always wondered that, uh, Andrew, because one of the Egyptian symbols of one of their gods was a snake on the pole. Yeah. And I, know, I, I guess it's something they might have seen before. But I always wondered why God chose a snake. Yeah. And in Greek? Stories, snakes on a pole. In fact, if you want to look for a medical insignia, what is it? Snakes, snakes on a pole. Brings healing. Mm. God took the very instrument of their suffering, the symbol of their sin, and uses it for their salvation. Now, there's some deep theology here. Jesus became sin for you and me. Paul writes, he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. So um, that snake on a pole is a powerful symbol of what Jesus will do for us. When we look to him, we will live. We're saved not through our own efforts, but by grace through faith to look and to live. Well, we keep reading, and I know I'm about out of time, so I'll just kind of mention some cool things. In chapter 21, we meet up against Og the giant. Uh, in Deuteronomy, we find out that he's 13 and a half feet tall, or at least that's how big his bed was. And uh, archaeologists have found tombs with sarcophaguses that big in this very area uh, that date from that time period. So that's kind of amazing in and of itself. Uh, but God gives them complete victory over Og the giant, uh, as we knew he would. In chapter 22, we meet up with Balaam. Balaam is a wise man from the east. Wise man as in magician, sorcerer. Uh, but he knows the one true God. Now, 
When I said wise men from the east, why is that familiar to you? Yeah, there were wise men from the east that came to see the newborn king. Y'all remember? How'd they get there? Following a star. Balaam is a wise man from the east. He is hired by the king of Moab. Now the Moabites were, were cousins to the Israelites. Uh, the Moabites are descendants of Lot, Abraham's nephew. Uh, but they have turned against them. And, and the king of Moab is scared. So he hires Balaam and he wants Balaam to pronounce a curse on the people. But every time Balaam tries, all he can pronounce are blessings. Going back to the promise God gave Abraham. Um, those who bless you, I will bless. Those who curse you, I will curse. Uh, and God turns Balaam's curses into blessings. Along the way, though, there's a fascinating story. Uh, Balaam is heading uh, to do these things. And if you look at chapter 22, he's on a donkey. And the donkey keeps turning around and rebelling and not doing what Balaam wants him to do. And he beats the donkey. And finally, the Lord frees the donkey's tongue. And the donkey speaks to Balaam. Uh, verse 28 of chapter 22. What have I done to you to make you beat me these three times? <laughs> so Balaam has a conversation with the donkey. And as you look carefully at the story, verse 31, then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the road with his sword drawn. So he bowed low and fell face down. Now, there are lots of miracles in the story. Is it possible that donkeys see things we don't see? In this story, it certainly is. And, and the Lord loosens the donkey's tongue. I've heard it said most of my life, if God can use a donkey, surely he can use me. Uh, God uses this donkey as, a, as an instrument in his hand and uh, it saves Balaam's life when he finally comes to his senses. The New Testament will talk a good bit about Balaam and not in positive terms. He is one of the people who leads Israel astray through adultery and through um, foreign women and so he's mentioned even in the book of Revelation as an example of idolatry. But one of the blessings that he gives is in chapter 24 he says in chapter 24, verse 17, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. Now, some of those words are fulfilled through the birth of David, but they find greater fulfillment through the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, keep turning the pages, and you'll see they take a second census of the new generation. This generation gets the choice again. Do we trust God and enter the promised land, or do we not? Um, in chapter 27, we learn that Joshua is going to succeed Moses as the leader. And by the time we get to the end of the book of Numbers, they're on the plains of Moab, on the edge of the promised land, ready to enter. And the setting is there for the book of Deuteronomy. The last book. The book of Deuteronomy takes place on the plains of Moab as Moses preaches to the people. The book of Deuteronomy is Moses' final sermon to the people. And we call it Deuteronomy. Duo means two. Deuteronomy means second law. So Moses will help them remember the laws and he'll give a, an account of all these things that have happened and remember God's goodness and give them warnings and blessings and curses uh, if they follow the Lord. Uh, and so Deuteronomy becomes a powerful expression that, 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 that as Moses instructs the people in his last hours with them. Um, so Numbers ends uh, setting us up for what's about to happen in this fifth and final book of Moses. In the New Testament, uh, there's much talk about the things that happen in Numbers. And Paul particularly, as well as the preacher in Hebrews, will remind us that these things are written here to help us so that we don't follow their poor example. In other words, you don't have to make every mistake yourself. <laughs> you can learn from the mistakes of others. And one of the big lessons out of Numbers is to stop grumbling, stop complaining, and start trusting God. He can do away with giants. 
He can remove the obstacles if we will trust Him, if we'll put our faith and confidence in Him. So Numbers is raised up as an example of what it means to not trust God and what it means to trust God and put our faith in Him as we look and live. Father, thank you for your word. So powerful, so incredible, so complex, and yet so simple. Help us to take it to heart. We ask in Jesus' name.